Good morning, everyone. Happy Thursday morning to you all. Thank you for joining the Leadership Lab today with us, where we are featuring two elementary school teams from the Clover Park School District. We are really excited to also have Dr. Adiemi Stembridge on with this Leadership Lab um, with us today, this morning, and he's also going to be joining us this afternoon for Leadership Lab with Vancouver Public Schools. So we are thrilled about that. We would love, if you haven't introduced yourself in the chat, um, we would love to see who you are um, and welcome you to this space. Thank you for joining us. My name is Nasue Nishida. I direct the Center for Strengthening the Teaching Profession. We go by C-STEP for short. And um, we have been working with OSPI and Sue Anderson in particular to um, figure out ways to spread the love around educator growth and development. And Sue will talk a little bit about her vision around that work. And we've been really excited um, to engage with Yemi around that work in our state. Um, so this is our first opportunity to showcase some of, some of that work that he has done in Clover Park and with these teachers. And we're really excited to bring that to you today. Before I get um, too far down the road, we'll, we'll go over some um, other little, little things, but the most frequently asked question I will get out of the way now. Yes, this is being recorded and we will upload and share it with you. Um, we understand people cannot make it for lots of reasons um, to these things and it will be, this will be recorded and, sh and be able to be shared. Um, and that, that also goes, if, if something comes up and you cannot stay for this entire leadership lab, you can pick up where you left off through the recording. All right, so let's get started. Um, we, because we cannot see people very well, or I've got kind of the Brady Bunch squares on my screen, um, we decided we would feature some larger profile pictures of the folks that you're going to be hearing from today. Um, which, you know, it's kind of uncomfortable when you see your face that big, but these beautiful faces are going to get to talk with you today, and we're really excited about that. Um, I first want to introduce Sue Anderson, who directs the Educator Effectiveness and Educator Growth and Development Office of OSPI, the Office of State Superintendent. And Sue's going to do a little welcome and then introduce our very special guest, Dr. Stembridge. Sue? Thanks, Nasue. Good morning, everyone. I wanna thank you for joining us in a virtual version of the Leadership Lab. I do wanna start by acknowledging the tremendous changes that have taken place in our world in the last few months and say how really in awe and how appreciative we at OSPI are of your resiliency and your creativity in continuing to serve the needs of our students in Washington. I'd also like to give a shout, shout out to Nasue and to Erin Marswick and Lindsay Stevens of C-STEP for coordinating this work and making this leadership lab happen um, in, a, in a different way, um, a way that, that we're gonna, continuing to learn from. And I also want to thank the teams from Rainier and Custer Elementary Schools in the Clover Park School District for joining us today. I first heard Dr. Stembridge speak at the 2018 WIRA conference as he shared his stories of teachers setting high bars for student learning, learning that takes into account not just what students know and can do, but also how they feel as learners and videos of students talking about the, this empowering learning and the impacts it was having on them. I had my TPEP hat on and I thought, wow, this could so change how we think about student growth goals. What I know now is that I was both right and wrong. Yes, what Dr. Stembridge shared could greatly impact how we think about student growth goals for TPEP, but that is certainly only the beginning of what this work can do. When we think of the opportunity gaps that students are experiencing, we often think about the systems that perpetuate these gaps. School funding, discipline, master schedules, attendance, grading systems, what stands out for me is that the framework that Dr. Stembridge describes for culturally responsive education, the six themes and the five planning questions are focused laser-like on the classroom. This is so powerful because 
While we know that racist institutions and systems must become more equitable and we can't let up on our pressure to make, them, make that happen, this doesn't happen overnight. But meanwhile, culturally responsive teachers engage and empower students right now, despite institutions and systems that might be perpetuating some of the gaps. I'm so grateful to Dr. Stanbridge for his work and for that of the teachers and administrators who have engaged in this work so deeply with him. I'm thrilled that you will all be able to learn more about it in your time with us today. Um, and I'd like to next introduce Dr. Stembridge. So he is an educational consultant specializing in equity-focused school improvement. He was the director of the Center for Strategic Solutions at the, the Metropolitan Center for Research on Equity and the Transformation of Schools at the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development at NYU. He is the author of this amazing book, which I hope comes into your life sooner rather than later. Um, and he's also the person who led the wonderful residencies that you're going to hear about today. I would also just like to say, perhaps most important, with all of the leadership positions that he has held and all of the research and work that he has done, what really comes through when you work with Dr. Stembridge is that his teacher heart is the most important thing that he carries around with him. And I, as I said, I'm just so thrilled that you'll have a chance to hear from him and from the people who've had the opportunity work to work with him today. Dr. Stembridge? Good morning, good morning. Um, and I wanna echo what Sue's saying. Thank you to everyone for coming out. I mean, it's, it's funny because I was at Rainier, when was that? That was like March? And it seems like decades ago, it was a whole different world. It's crazy how much has changed in such a short period of time. But I'm gonna take a few minutes here and um, just talk a little bit about the residency model and, um, so, and, and kind of the background story on where the residency model has come from. So um, as Sue said, I am fascinated by brilliant teaching. It, um, it, 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 it just excites me like few other things. I've got behind me, I've got a playlist of some of my favorite um, artists and their collections playing in. The feeling of being in the presence of a masterpiece is uh, one of the near appropriate approximations of how I feel when I'm in the presence of a classroom where the students are engaged and they're led to think rigorously and all parts of their identity and their background is available to them in demonstrating their competence in putting together the building blocks of the understandings that we want for them. And, um, and so for me, um, I, I, uh, I defended my dissertation in 2007 and essentially just like basically right after that, I just dove head in to um, trying to figure out what is it that is happening in these classrooms where the, um, the, the gaps that we might be able to predict in terms of performance and achievement are, um, are, are, are not showing up in the ways that we could otherwise predict them to show up. So the six themes that you might be hearing about today in, uh, in different parts of our, of our session, um, relationships, cultural identity, vulnerability, um, rigor, engagement, and why am I drawing a blank on the, on the sixth one? What's my sixth? I promise you, I wrote the book. These are my themes. Um, assets. These six themes came about over um, about a decade of me working intimately with teachers in professional development spaces. Now, here's the thing about PD. And teachers don't agree with me on this. Just kind of, kind of mute your audio. Don't, don't agree with me when I say this. What I experienced as a teacher was most PD was crap. Now, it was well-intentioned crap, and it was coming from a good place, but it was um, premised on this notion 
that the professional development that was being delivered is unquestionably useful to me and that I would find it meaningful. And um, it doesn't matter from a professional development facilitator's perspective if I'm right about that. What matters is that my teachers, the people whom I am trying to support with the knowledge and information and skills that I'm bringing to bear, I need them to see that the premise of this professional development is useful to them and worthy of their engagement. Because teachers have a lot to do. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir right now, right? One of the things that may happen as a result of this current health crisis is I do think that at least in the communities that we work with directly, there's going to be a greater appreciation for the craft of teaching. So as I'm trying to figure out how do I communicate this idea of culturally responsive education, this idea of equity more broadly, I think of equity as a philosophical construct that, um, that, that uh, it, it speaks to the way opportunity is perceived. Uh, equity is this notion, it's a belief really, that says that if our students are getting what they need and if they are being led to think in rigorous ways that leverage what they bring to bear, they're going to they're gonna be more likely to dig in. They're going to be more likely to trust us. They're going to be less likely to disrupt learning opportunities and, um, and more likely to, um, to make the connections and craft the understandings that, that resonate most powerfully for them. That's what we're trying to do in the classroom. And so uh, for me, I, I try to develop professional development um, that also does similar things for teachers. So the residency is an opportunity for um, people to come together, small space. Uh, the, the two residencies that we did in Washington, we had four days. And, um, you know, um, it's, it's always super fun for me on the first day because you got some teachers who'll come in there and there'll be a little bit of this and uh, there'll be a little bit of, what are we going to do for four days? Uh, four days of professional development? You got me away from my kids for four days? And I honor that and I take that very seriously because I think that a teacher should be um, cautious about leaving their, uh, their classroom and their students for such an extended period of time. And so what the residency allows us to do is it allows us to center ourselves in, a, um, in, in, a, in a, an inquiry, right? We're going after something. We're trying to figure out something. We're trying to figure out what exactly does culturally responsive education mean? And then what does it look like in my classroom with my kiddos? Because for me, not speaking for anybody, for me, a lot of times when I was in equity professional development, I would hear these big, grandiose, beautiful ideas, beautiful ideas, ideas that I did not disagree with, but ideas that I had a hard time figuring out, how do I make this applicable in my work? One of my favorite words that I learned in my um, research and investigation around culturally responsive education. It's in the book. Um, it comes from the work of Gloria Ladson Billings. Uh, she wrote a book called Dream Keepers, and Dream Keepers was her, her effort to um, study the practices of effective teachers, particularly with, in her work, African-American boys, and try to figure out what are these teachers doing. And um, one of the uh, really important articles that came out even before the book came out was an article called, But That's Just Good Teaching. She was sharing her work with one of her colleagues. Her colleagues was reading it, giving it review and said, yeah, you know, but I don't necessarily see what is so unique and different about what you're doing for what these teachers are doing for black boys. It just seems like that's good. That's just good teaching. To which Gloria Ladson Billings responded, well, the question is, why are so few African-American students having the opportunity to receive the good teaching that we can so easily recognize. So for me, the themes were um, initially just me trying to chunk out this idea of culturally responsive education. What does it mean? Um, what are the building blocks? What are the, the big ideas that we can start to wrap our brains around so that we can, coming back to Gloria Latson Billings' word, operationalize these beautiful ideas in the content context of our practice. Because if you've been teaching for two years, one thing you know abundantly clear 
The things that you do to be successful in one classroom, while the essence of those things might translate and allow you to be successful in another classroom, you, the same person from one year to the next, you've got to adjust your practice or your practice gets stale. And if our practice gets stale, then the only students that you can successfully teach are what I call school-proof students. The students who are going to do well, uh, basically, uh, regardless of what kind of a teacher they have in front of them. So the six themes were initially an opportunity to um, just kind of chunk out the biggest ideas. And if we're talking about these things, then we're probably talking about the right things in the right way. And then um, over the course of time, I realized, well, you know what, it's possible to, to be a person who actively pursues in all parts of your life um, an anti-racist agenda. You are challenging um, the different isms that might limit the opportunities that some people have to be successful. Like this might really be in your heart and you might still be a terrible math teacher. And, um, and if you are, you know, in your heart, a uh, equitable minded person, uh, even pursuing an anti-racist agenda, standing up against, um, you know, the, uh, the different structures that limit opportunities for our students in society. And if you can't teach a kid uh, how to unpack theme in their literature, well, you know, it's not really going to work for the kid. And so this work has been trying to figure out how do we bring those two together, our equity questions, the questions that we ask about whom we teach, and our pedagogy questions, the questions that we ask about how we teach. So then the five planning questions came about um, over the years and just figuring out, okay, now let's, 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 let's not just talk about these big ideas. Let's actually, you know, try to take them back into the classroom and see if they work on real live human children. And, um, and in the course of doing that, what I started doing was, and this is again, this is about a, you know, about a, about a 10 or 11 year, you know, journey. And so, um, and, and I just want you to also think about something. Think about if you had the opportunity to hang out in 300 badass teachers' classrooms. Like, just think about if, if you're present there and how much you can absorb and how much you can, can learn. And that's, that's me. That's what I've been doing for, you know, more than a decade. So in thinking about the six themes of CRE, being clear about what it is we should be talking about in order to be culturally responsive, in order to give every kiddo the fairest opportunity to be successful, which is not equality, giving every kid the same opportunity to be successful. We would think about these big ideas, these themes, plan learning experiences, and then go back into a classroom and try it out. And when we were successful, I began to take inventory and enlist my, my, my fellow colleagues in this, in this conversation of what did we talk about when we planned that allowed us to create this learning experience that really works for kids. And so um, we ended up with these five planning questions. What do you want students to understand? What do you want students to feel? What are the targets for rigor? What are the indicators for engagement? And what are the opportunities to be responsive? And so I am the person who always tells people there is no way that you can reduce a complex task like teaching to a simple checklist. This is not like baking a pound cake, all right? As much as your grandmother may have made a delicious pound cake when you were a kid and you may swear that no one else on the planet can make a pound cake as delicious, I promise you, if I have that recipe, and I follow it specifically, I will make a, a pound cake that is comparable to your beloved grandmother's pound cake. But teaching in our classrooms, I'm preaching to the choir here, is not that simple. It's a complex task. And so asking the five planning questions and using the vocabulary of the six themes, I have found regularly and likely brings us to learning experiences that our kids can really invest themselves in. And so the residency is an intense experience where we get to sit down together for multiple days um, talking about the content of culturally responsive education, i.e. the six themes, and then our process for fleshing out those six themes into uh, the design of learning experiences that can uh, really work for kids. 
and then we get to go into the classroom and we get to try it out. And um, when we go into the classroom and try it out, we, um, we, have, we, can, we can emerge with an even deeper understanding of not only what was working, but why. Because we all have, you know, that skin in the game. We've all been present in this design conversation where we're trying to figure out not only what it is we're going to do, but to what end. We're trying to create salience for our students so that our students say, oh, this is, this is relevant. This, uh, this, th this, oh, there's a connection here. Oh, I know something about that. And then once we can get kids to make those kinds of connections, and those are all very much cultural in, in substance, when we can get kids to make those kinds of a connection, there are, there's, there's momentum that's available to us. And so for me, one of my, one of my most fun things that I, that I get to do uh, in the old world, you know, we'll see what this looks like in the new world, um, is I get to go into the classroom and I get to see when it works. And it just, you know, just being completely transparent, it's especially fun when there was some doubt on the part of the teacher, I don't think this is gonna work. And then we go into the classroom and then it works. And then you see in the, I see in the teacher's face, the teacher's like, oh, wow, that worked. And I'm like, yeah, this worked, keep going, let's keep going, let's keep doing it. So the, uh, the residency, typically what we do, what we did at both um, Custer and Rainier is that we, um, we spent our first day, day and a half, are really just kind of just centering ourselves in content. One of the things that I found that works very well with the themes is it doesn't matter where you start. You can start on um, rigor. And if we're starting on rigor, what we're talking about is how do we get kids thinking critically? How do we get kids thinking beyond just rote memorization and getting kids to synthesize and analyze and evaluate and create? And in order to do that, what you have to do is you have to be able to connect with our students and their experiences, their backgrounds, their identities. And so that means you can't talk about rigor for too long without talking about cultural identity. Because in order, my, you know, we all have our favorite cognitive scientists. My favorite cognitive scientist is Mary Helen E. Mordino Yang at the uh, University of Southern California. And one of her um, uh, sayings is she says, you can't think about anything Deeply, it is scientifically, neuro, neurologically impossible to think about something deeply that you don't care about. And, um, and so what we do is we try to figure out, okay, what, 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 what might our kids care about in order for them to then accept this invitation to think rigorously? to really challenge themselves to stretch their thinking beyond just repeating, regurgitating what they anticipate teachers want to hear. Um, if you're talking about uh, assets, the, uh, the, the, the knowledge, the skills, the dispositions, the familiarities that students bring with them into the classroom, you know, you can't talk about assets for too long without talking about engagement. We are more engaged in spaces where our assets are utilized. So what I, what I found about the six themes is that, um, and what I typically do in the first day, day and a half of the residency, is I essentially just ask teachers, well, of these six themes, what do you want to talk about? Here's the other thing, is that a lot of times in predominantly white spaces, um, I understand that there's this hesitation for a lot of times for white educators to engage in uh, forthcoming conversations about race, because, um, you know, people don't want to be a they don't want to stumble over a question or through an explanation and then, you know, end up being called a racist. Okay, I get it. I get it. Um, but that's something that we're going to have to be able to get over because part of, part of what we've been doing is in the interest of protecting uh, teachers from uh, maybe misconceptions about their beliefs based on an inarticulate expression, we are... Um, muting conversations that we need to have. And what the residency allows us to do is to have some of those conversations in the context of pedagogy, a lesson that we're going to teach, which I've found makes it a, a more accessible conversation. So for example, something like assets. Your cultural identity informs what you see as an asset in another human being where you share cultural fluency with others, 
where you are familiar with the cultural norms, the expectations for how people are supposed to behave, the history of what's considered good, bad, right, wrong, appropriate, inappropriate, where you have that kind of cultural familiarity, that cultural fluency, you are more likely to see assets in others with those same cultural fluencies. Even often when those people who share those cultural fluencies with you, even when they're demonstrating objectively bad behaviors. You've got context and history and background that allows you to identify maybe some seemingly reasonable expl explanations for those bad behaviors. So the residency, day one, day two, we kind of figure out what we want to talk about, what are the, the themes that matter most to us, and then we, um, we go through designing a learning experience, which really, for me, it doesn't matter what kind of learning experience we design, it matters can I help teachers enter into their own personal relationship with the questions, with the planning questions? And, um, and you know, over, over several days, going into classrooms, designing learning experiences, coming back, reflecting, looking specifically on snapshots of engagement, what was working for kids, what does that require of us? Um, you know, very often we're able to, uh, to leave those spaces with insights that we can continue to build on and leverage in our practice. So it's, uh, the residencies are, are one model that I use and, you know, obviously right now in this next normal that we'll eventually um, have in our world, I'm, I'm working on right now online versions of the residency and trying to figure out, you know, how do we replicate some of that and save engagement, some of that same energy. I'm still working on that, still figuring it out and open and available to suggestions from especially my folks at Custer and, and Rainier. Um, but what I found is that the residency ends up creating this opportunity for a feeling of safety, a feeling of collegiality, and also a feeling of challenge. Because I want my teachers to feel challenged. I don't want you to come and, and, and hang out with me for three or four days and, and walk away and not feeling challenged. So again, something I listen for often is I listen for people to tell me, oh my goodness, man, my, my brain is hurting. I'm, I'm tired. How, you know, like this is, this was exhausting. When I hear that, it, it, it confirms for me that, um, that I was present, that I was pushing our thinking and, um, and, and, and maximizing the, uh, the time that we had together. So soon I sway, I think I'm going to kind of just stop right there for now. And then what I'm going to be doing is, uh, is listening in. I don't know if we have any time if there are any questions or clarifying um, that we want to do right now. But I'm going to be popping into the breakout rooms and kind of taking notes so that I can um, make sure that I'm being as responsive as possible when I come back and offer some remarks at the tail end of this. Thank you, Yemi. And we are going to have some Q&A time at the end of today as well. So yes, you will have opportunities, everyone out there, um, to engage with Yemi. So Yemi definitely set up the foundation for what you're going to hear from Clover Park. Um, teachers from Custer Elementary and Rainier Elementary and their principals are going to be sharing with you about their reflections of working with Yemi through these teacher residencies. And this statement here is just to let you know, um, these leadership labs are designed to help share that kind of information around practices, strategies, ideas that people have been trying out that, that, that are working. And we, we like to elevate those kinds of things and share them widely in a leadership lab format. Um, I will just tell you, have grace with us as we move this leadership lab format into this virtual setting. Um, this is meant to be a discussion format and this is really hard to do virtually with 66 of you. <laughs> but we are, we're, we're giving it a shot and we appreciate you for hanging on with that. The other thing I want to share is the leadership lab idea. I wish it were our own as if we made something novel and new. It's not. We, we took this idea from the U.S. Department of Education. Um, Arnie Duncan way back when, when he was the secretary, did these leadership labs as a way to go deeper into practices he saw happening around the country. We took that idea and just made a version here that we um, have been using in Washington with different opportunities. Um, and then this one obviously is the first time we're doing this as an online leadership lab. So credit to the Department of Ed. A couple of little housekeeping items as we move forward today. 
Um, because after I just said this is supposed to be a discussion, would you please mute yourselves? I know that doesn't sound right. Um, but we are going to have the Clover Park team share their work. And just for sake of distraction and background noise, please make sure that your um, mics are muted. The chat is open and I noticed some of you are chatting away, so feel free to use that. Um, if there are questions you have, you may want to wait until the end of Clover Park's presentation because you may get some answers there, um, but you can most certainly post questions there and we will try to get to those throughout the time. The Leadership Lab is being recorded and we will share that information with you following this. And then Aaron Marswick, who is really the brains behind all of this happening, um, is available. If you have technical issues, you can contact Erin. Her email is right there and you are. She also sent out the verification for your Zoom link today. So please contact her if there's any questions there. All right, let's get started. So we have two awesome teams um, of educators sharing with you today. This is the Custer Elementary team, and I'd like them to introduce themselves because I also just want to double check your mics are working and functioning. So um, Kathy, would you start us off and just let us know who you are and maybe a, um, a little bit about yourself would be great. So hi there, I'm Kathy Waymiller, proud principal at Custer, and I'm so honored to be with this team. This is my first year of Custer, I most recently was a district level um, communications director. Um, before that, um, gosh, I don't know how many years in elementary principalship. And it, it's just an honor to be part of this um, opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Kanani? Hi, my name is Kanani Thaxton. I'm, uh, I've been at Custer for three years, um, teaching fifth grade this year, uh, third grade last year as well as four or five split change in the middle of the year and then fourth grade prior to that uh, prior to teaching uh, hula instructor for 20 plus years and a military spouse for a long time <laughs> so great to be here thank you thanks kanani lindsay hi i am lindsay vincent gunn i teach fifth grade at custer this is my fourth year at custer I taught third grade the first two years and now fifth grade for two years now. So I have um, about half my class are kids that I've had before, which is pretty neat. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm so thankful I was able to take part in this. Thanks, Lindsay. Shannon. I am Shannon Paul. I teach a 3-4 split this year at Custer. Last year I taught a third grade with Kanani for half a year. And uh, we have a great little school and a great team. I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Shannon. Teresa. Hi, I'm Teresa Prather, and I teach fourth grade at Custer this year. I've been in education for more than 30 years, but um, have taught second, third, fourth, and spent my last eight years in um, building administration as a principal and um, missed that daily contact with a group of kids. And so this is my first year at Custer and I'm thrilled to be there. Thank you, Teresa. And here we have the Rainier Elementary team led by their principal, Kylie. Kylie, I'm gonna let you do your introduction, please. So I'm Kylie Danielson. I'm the principal at Rainier. I've been here for five years and then was an assistant principal before that and then taught in the Clover Park School District as well. So my whole um, career has been with Clover Park kids. Thanks, Kylie. Angela. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Angela Crow. Uh, this is my second year at Rainier. I teach fourth grade. I also am a military spouse, so have taught all around the world. I've taught pre-K, kindergarten, first, and second. My uh, 15th year teaching. Um, love Clover Park. Um, loved getting to work with Yemi and uh, looking forward to sharing it with you today. Thank you, Angela. Jody. Hi, I'm Jody Springer. I teach at Rainier. My whole teaching career has been at Clover Park Schools out on the base, coming to teaching a little bit later in life, but I've been teaching for, I think, 14, 14 years now. I've taught everything pretty much except for first grade, everything elementary. 
and fourth grade is my first love. So um, this is my first year after a couple year break. This is my first year back in the classroom and I am loving it. Thank you, Jody. Jessica Anderson. Hi, Jessica Anderson, fifth grade at Rainier, um, top first through fifth. Uh, this is my 13th year in the district and I'm a diehard Clover Park gal, born and raised in the district and chose to stay here. Super excited about uh, what I've learned and sharing with you today and to continue the journey. Thank you, Jessica. And Jessica Nadal. Hi, I'm Jessica Nadal. Um, I've been at Rainier for four years. I've been teaching for 12. I'm a military spouse, so I've taught in um, different states as well. I've been uh, second grade, third grade, fifth grade, and an interventionist. Great. Thank you to Custer and Rainier teams. First question for these teams to answer. Some of us have heard Yemi speak. We may have read his book, Culturally Responsive Education in the Classroom. Here it is on my screen. It's a beautiful cover. Or we've heard other people talk about his work. How would you explain his ideas about this to people who aren't familiar with his work? Well, I'm going to get us started here. This is Teresa. And when joining the residency with Dr. Stembridge, I wasn't sure what to expect. I'd been in education for a long time and love being around students and educators that are energetic. And I think what I got from that was a reassurance. There is no magic bullet. There's nothing that we can say, do this and students will be successful. It's a very complex task. And it starts with building relationships and knowing that you have to have that head and heart combination for kids. That, and if you don't have that relationship with kids, we're not able to push on those high rigor moments. And it is not doing students a good service to allow them to be less than what they're capable of. And to do that, it means that you have to really understand yourself and how you see other people and, uh, and students as a whole. That culturally responsive education is not a focus on a culture or cultures, but it's designing an educational experience that's applicable to all students. Um, it's not about choosing the right strategy, but developing a plan for student understanding. And in order to be at that high level of rigor and understanding, they have to feel engaged and a desire to engage. It's not um, pick one idea and go with it. Those five planning questions that Dr. Stembridge talked about were so evident and just reaffirmed what I know to be good instruction, like he had talked about. I not prior to his residency thought about the feeling I wanted students to leave the experience with as important or more important than the knowledge I wanted them to leave the experience with. And so I've thoroughly enjoyed my time in the residency. And I'm sure you're going to hear a lot more from my colleagues. Jessica or Shannon, do you want to share? Um, I'll go ahead and go next. That way Shannon can do the end part. Um, the, um, the main thing that um, my partner, Jessica Anderson, and I, we really do stress relationships in fifth grade, and we'd been doing that all year, and it was really nice to kind of come into a space um, where a professional development was set up not to tell us what we were doing wrong, but to reinforce what we were doing, and then to push us further and say, that is great. Like Dr. Stembridge was like, that's great. I'm glad you do that. Okay, so now you're going to do this. And he, you know, it, it was good to not feel like 
sometimes we'll get into a place where we're complacent with what we're doing. We're like, oh, I do that. I do that. I do that. And he was like, yeah, you do. And now you're going to do this. And it was great because he really pushed us further into um, that, 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 that the art of the education that we were looking for was that we do a lot of work for the planning, do in-depth unit planning, figuring out exactly what we want the students to leave with from, from the academic perspective and from the emotional perspective and from the relational perspective of they understand this topic that well. So we do all that heavy to do work in the beginning. And then when we get into the classroom, we turn over the control to the students and they're involved in it. It's not, this is me telling you what you need to learn. This is them working together and saying, oh, did you get this part of it? Oh yeah, yeah, I got that part. Did you get that part? And, and watching them work together, leading the conversations, it really, um, you know, it's one thing for us to say, oh, let's plan this so that our, our kids that don't get engaged in conversation will get engaged. Because it was so well planned, those kids didn't have an opportunity to turn off. They were engaged because it was their learning. It was them talking to each other. It was them taking control. It was them driving that bus. Now, they didn't realize that, you know, we'd already mapped out the course we wanted them to go on, but they were behind that wheel driving it, and they were so excited. And, um, you know, Jessica and I always have very boisterous classes because that's just kind of how we are as teachers. But they were so into it, and it was so awesome just to sit back for a minute and just watch them and watch them be so engaged. And, and I remember when, um, when everyone, because I had um, the whole team came in and watched my class, which is usually nerve wracking for me, but they were in there and I was just watching my students and I was like, I, I, couldn't, have, I couldn't have paid them to act any better than they did. They were just so good. And I was like, it was that proud mama moment. And I just sat back and I was like, they're getting this. I love this, you know? And, and yes, it was a lot of work in the beginning, but it made it so much more enjoyable, the teaching. You know, sometimes we're like, oh, I have to do this in the curriculum or I have to do that. No, the curriculum is the tool that we use to map out our path. And then our students are driving it. So, you know, each lesson, each day is going to be different. Next year is going to be totally different from what the year before it was, you know. And I, I really enjoyed that. I loved breaking down the pieces of figuring out what makes us tick, what makes our students tick, and how we can appreciate everything about each other. And I really do synthesize a lot of his work as art. And I think about it in that each of our students is a different piece of art and we have to look at what we can understand about them, what we need to learn about them and how we can make it into this beautiful class mural. So that was my takeaway. Shannon. One of the unique parts of being involved with Dr. Stembridge was having this long-term four-day experience where there weren't the distractions in other places. And we talked a lot about how important it is that the students have an understanding and a mastery over the content, that it's not about memorizing, it's not about working towards an assessment, but being fully engaged from the beginning. And uh, we had the ability to sit down with our own curriculum and take it apart and put it back together in a way that would be much more meaningful for the kids and much more engaging. So it was really exciting to uh, build that and then take it into a classroom and see it work and then step back out of the classroom and take it apart and talk about it. So what we did um, he taught us about looking at an experience that they connect to right away and, and we keep going back to that experience, the big question. Um, so we were able to start with ideas about what we wanted them to experience, um, not necessarily going step by step through the curriculum. And then we also were able to create our own resource to introduce it and I think we're going to cue that up so you can see how we help them connect to what they were entering into. Teresa's going to help me with that. Yes, so hopefully this will go well. 
And um, I am going He's to laughing at you. us right now. <laughs> um, so this is a video that Shannon and I created for a math lesson in my classroom to introduce math vocabulary and taking Dr. Stembridge's idea of that we have that relationship with kids. And so it's what we do and setting up that initial experience. So this is what we came up with. Good morning, fourth grade. I am factory foreman Paul here at the Hershey factory. I'm here to talk about factories and how they make different products. Here in my factory, we make chocolate. We bring together factors and we make products. Some of our products can only be made with one set of factors, like our milk chocolate, Hershey Kisses. Other products can come together with different combinations of factors to make that product. Just like in my factory, math uses those same rules. A product has only one set of factors, we call that a prime number. A product that has more than one set of factors, we call a composite number. Just like in my factory, factor times factor equals product. Thinking and engagement equals learning. So let's get back to our class. Put on your thinking cap and get ready to engage. So at the end, Shannon and I gave all the kids Hershey kisses, but they were definitely engaged in the math at that point. Yes. Thank you, very helpful. All right, next question for these teams. Describe after your teacher residencies how your work has been impacted or has changed. And I just want um, participants to know, uh, Yemi was at um, Custer Elementary in January and at the very end of February, he was at Rainier and then you know what hit in March. So. The, these folks have not had a lot of time before something very large and big has changed everything in education. Um, but I, I am, they do have things to share about how their work has been impacted and changed. And I'd love to, we'd love to hear that from you. I'd love to begin if that's okay. Jessica Anderson from Rainier. Um, so my biggest takeaway on how my work has been impacted and changed was the level of interaction and discourse that my students had with each other. And as my counterpart, Jessica, had said, um, we have very interactive, boisterous, fun classrooms where kids are currently engaging in discourse regularly, but not on the same level. Um, so it took even, you know, down a different path where I physically reorganized my room to make it to where that student-to-student -student discourse could happen regularly and not just at small portions, in my lessons, but throughout and at a more intense level. Also, it changed my instruction in the sense of uh, how I delivered it, where it wasn't just a, a large portion of, you know, by fifth grade, they can sit, do, take notes. Uh, a large portion of me teaching them, listening with little bits here and there, but more like shorter, shorter teaching spurts and then letting the students dive deeply into a question, break it apart, work through it um, instead of more of a teacher-led discussion. It really, really was helpful. The second piece that was so huge for me was uh, Yemi really stressed incentivizing critical thinking, not incentivizing compliance. And, you know, I would not on purpose, was incentivizing compliance. In my classroom, we do scouts, which is a GLAD strategy where students are looking out 
for other students making good choices, following directions, and initially it was all compliance based. And uh, it has been really great. And again, it was a minimal amount of time, in, you know, to do this that with my students, but seeing the shift in them uh, and the scouts and what they were looking for in each other uh, as far as who was really killing it in the classroom and not looking at, oh, you're behaving, you're quiet, you're there, but recognizing each other for their critical thinking and the contributions they're making academically and thought, you know, as a thought leader. Um, it took us a while to transition, and they, but it was really great to see. The last piece that was huge for me was he taught us about productive struggle. And I always called it in my class, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, but it's a whole lesson on teaching kids that the struggle comes um, or struggling through something uh, to continue to per persist through the problem and to embrace that difficulty without shutting down. And that's where the true learning comes in and the strengthening you know, of your abilities. So um, those were my big takeaways. Um, Kanani uh, Thaxton from Custer. Um, very much similar um, takeaways uh, from Shannon and Jessica was that the the experience was a huge ordeal. Um, thinking or just I think it's more just rethinking. And then I kept on coming up to uh, Dr. Stembridge. Like this is it's al it was almost a relief because we were taking the curriculum and just seeing it as tools and not going to the curriculum guide and it's like, okay, what's next, you know? And it was really about, okay, what pockets of information do my students still need? Uh, what don't they get? And then how are we gonna create an experience um, so that the students remember that experience for every little tiny lesson we do afterwards? So um, he, he was very adamant about using all Art, um, open up with a GIF. Um, it's a GIF, not GIF. That's what we learned. Um, and and we use that in that very that very next day's lesson, um, um, uh, like a a football GIF to explain math. And it was just really good because it was actually a little ironic because we had already stopped football because they weren't doing it really well at recess. Um, but it was. It was good because the kids got engaged right away. They're like, oh, and they're just starting to talk about football. And then we were able to connect that, they were able to connect that immediately to the lessons that they were that they were given. Um, the engagement part and the interaction between students just completely heightened after we started um, rethinking, after I started rethinking, okay, I'm doing something that I thought was effective, but after we had switched the thought process about how students uh, really learn and, and looking at what we taught and what worked and what can we do next, um, it really changed the dynamics in the classroom where I said I, I also ended up changing physically things in the room where I would slap just pieces of paper around the room, just chart paper all over the room, whether it be on the floor or on the walls, I would just cover things and all the students would immediately have to get up, form groups of three, go to a problem. It's already written on top of the chart or on the board that they have to um, engage in. And, and they just had to work with each other. And it was amazing to see that some of the students that didn't quote unquote know anything we were like, oh, we had a handout the other day. And so they went and grabbed it. They brought it back to the chart paper and they're like, can we use this? And the other students that kind of knew it, they're like, oh yeah, we can use that. Where's the other paper? So they were constantly going back to the resources. And, um, and it was, it could have been, it was, sometimes it was problem. It were, uh, they were problems that we didn't even see yet. Like they didn't know anything about it. I didn't teach a lesson on it yet. Uh, it was just that opening experience, like, okay, what does she want us to do? And they just figured it out on their own. So I think just the biggest takeaways was just the, like changing our thought process around teaching, not going immediately to the curriculum guide and really just just hard thinking, okay, what, what are the pockets of information that they still need and how are we going to teach it to them successfully? So it was great.
Angela, do you want to speak? Yeah. So I went Rainier. So I did the, we did the end of February. So we had the end of February and then two weeks. But I have to tell you that Yimmy was so exciting to listen to. Just the very next day, our um, um, workshop went through Monday through Thursday. And on Friday, I jumped in and did an activity with my kids. And it was a brain activity. And we had talked all year. Sorry, that's my cuckoo clock of all times, 10 o'clock. Um, <laughs> the um, talking about um, making connections in the way that your brain works. And then the next week I moved into doing some activities and that we had talked about, like Jody and I had planned the whole unit. We were able to do that with Yemi, our reading unit, we, which was great about the workshop. We had a whole, you know, given that time, he wanted to make sure that we went away with something. And um, we started our um, reading unit. And I have to tell you that it wasn't as successful as it was the week before. But I think that that was something that Yimmy really um, pointed out to us, that not everything is going to be successful the first time. But some things that I did um, take away from it, some of my kids who um, I would think were not thinkers really surprised me. They really struggle academically, but when given the opportunity to express more in the deep thinking, that was something they could do. Even if they have trouble reading, I have one particular kid that has trouble reading, but um, for example, we were doing a book, but he didn't read the book, but he had watched the movie and he had great insight on that. So I like it that um, giving kids opportunity to um, get into the rigor of, you know, if I had just gone with the content and the reading, that wouldn't have been okay. If I would have said, no, you know, you only watch the movie. So giving um, kids that opportunity um, and letting them know that the struggle is good. When we do, um, that was another thing that Yumi pointed out. Some kids, other kids who can't think well, it's okay that you can take ideas from other people, other kids. And that was something that we're trying to build a culture that even if you struggle with something, it's okay to, um, to, to steal your ideas or take an idea from other people and that helps your learning grow. Um, definitely starting you, you, the units with um, rigor. And in a fun way, we started, um, we did, uh, I did a picture where we were doing a thing on pirates and they looked at pirates and on balloons, they um, got to think what they, I showed them a pic two pictures of boats and they got to think what they thought was happening. And one, it was very obvious that it was a pirate ship and the other not. And then later on, we didn't get to finish the unit because we ended up going home, but you could, we did it twice and you could tell the thinking that they were doing was growing as we were going on. So not being able to see um, a lot, but to be able to see some. And um, it was just great. It was, I, I think, I'm disappointed that we didn't get to work on it more, but already excited about next year getting back into the class and um, starting the whole unit is very important. You know, being able to work through the whole unit to let this kids grow. Thank you, Angela. And we have a Rainier teacher who needs to exit at 1015. So I just would like you all to be able to hear from Jody before she goes. Jody, do you want to speak a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so I wanted to share some things that I learned. One was that lots of times, like Yimmy said, professional development, it, while its intent is really awesome, sometimes it's hard to make it work in your classroom. It can be kind of nebulous. So what Yemi has done is taken a lot of those nebulous pieces and given us a way to make them actionable. Because um, I saw a lot of PD in the past that I've had, pieces I could use in there that I never saw before. Yeah, that's a really great idea. But I'm not really sure how to use it. Or maybe it's not practical. So I wanted to share that. I also wanted to share something that was really powerful where he, he showed us this classroom or, or he told us about it. It's this little girl who was kind of oppositional. She questioned everything, but they used that to, um, as part of the lesson. And in the end, she ended up teaching the lesson for them. 
Um, Cause it was about counting and different colors of popsicle sticks and what the value was. And so she was like, oh no, everybody, you gotta count cause we're not all the same. So she found something that was right. <laughs> so it was very clever. And that really made an impression on me. So like Angela said, we tried it out in our classrooms. It was really terrific. And in fact, it was so powerful that even though part of what I had done in my class based on fractions didn't quite work out the way I thought it would, um, it got way too broad. But after, I think it was like the week, the next week or the week after that, right before, two, like two days before we had to leave school, I went back to my big question and every one of my students remembered. They remembered what they had talked about. And it was that powerful. And they built on that. And in the end, they walked out with that big understanding that I wanted them, that I wanted to see them develop. So it, I really liked that part. And that was really great. Um, I think in order to, because one of my questions was, how do you sustain, grow and sustain this work? It's, it's easier if you have PLC buy-in with your group, um, because what, it's more powerful if you can plan with somebody else and if they're doing the same thing you're doing. So I think that um, you need ongoing, you need ongoing exposure with these kind of workshops because every time you get exposed, it's like the same thing with our kids, right? You're gonna understand it at a deeper level and you're gonna be able to put it in your practice more. So that's mostly what I wanted to share. Thank you, Jody. And if you can join us later, please jump on. Thank you. Kathy, as a principal um, at Custer, we would love to hear, um, as you participated in also in the residency, how have you looked at your work differently or how has it been impacted or changed? Um, it's been really impacted in that I'm really mindful now of looking for ways to make this contagious. And there's two things that strike me about this. One, I think the principal's role is to keep their mouth shut and get out of the way. I think that, you know, that was kind of the most, it wasn't about what I know, it's about what, what the teachers could learn um, from each other. And I learned by listening to that process and, um, and then creating the time and space to allow things to happen, to, to help get the subs and have a physical space to make sure that they have all of their needs met so they can do this work. And um, a shout out to the team though, it would not have worked had they not been willing to be vulnerable with each other because these are all master teachers who were willing to share their fears and their failings with each other in order to collectively move forward together. And so try, for me, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways to, to have an environment in our building where that's contagious and that is normal. And um, I don't know that any building is, is all the way there, but I'm way more mindful of it than I used to be. Thank you, Kathy. All right, our next question, and Jody kind of talked to this before she uh, jumped off. How do, you, how do you grow this work? And you kind of talked about it a little bit too, Kathy. How do you grow and sustain this work? And that's, um, you know, that, that's, it's one thing to experience it, experience it and try some things out. Um, it's another thing to, you know, hopefully make it contagious. Not, I don't mean to make a reference to the virus, but, you know, you want it, you want it to spread and you want it to sustain. How do you do that? What have you thought about? Well, um, this is Teresa again, and so um, in thinking about how to grow this work and sustain it over time, uh, it really takes the administrative support that Kathy was just talking about. We're fortunate at Custer to have Kathy as supportive as she is, um, and as Jody mentioned, that PLC buy-in, so that when working together with a group of colleagues, um, if everyone's under the same notion, 
and using those same five planning questions that Dr. Stembridge um, reinforces so thoughtfully, we were able to take depth of knowledge charts and our standards and our curriculum. We didn't toss out our curriculum. We kept it, but we used the best parts of it and were very intentional and not just turn the page, what's next? That curriculum became a resource and that was really powerful. Um, allowing us to take it apart and put it back together in a way that made sense but still maintaining um, fidelity to the resource as well. Uh, to grow it and sustain these efforts, it does take that being vulnerable. It means that during this uh, residency, we each opened up our classrooms at, to each other. And we all came into each other's classes, observed lessons from start to finish, and that's a real vulnerable spot to be. But before we went into those classrooms, Dr. Stembridge was very, very intentional that we weren't there watching the teacher. We were there watching student engagement and opportunities to respond. And with the acknowledgement that mistakes are the way that we learn. To continue this work does mean that having those opportunities to have learning walks where we can go and see each other and discuss what we see in a non-evaluative way. The, the focus was on the work of the students, the engagement of the students, and knowing those students from within our school boundaries, not having someone from outside come in and observe our student interactions, but having each other we know those kids. And so that, in a way to move forward, will be powerful going into next year. Even this year in this virtual world, inviting my colleagues, come on to one of my um, online sessions with kids, look for and help me and discuss with me those opportunities to engage and be responsive. That that discussion, has to happen after the lessons are taught so that we can have that in our mindset as we move forward with future lessons as well. It is a vulnerable process to have someone come in and watch what's going on in your classroom, but it is the best way to really create um, powerful, impactful, meaningful change. Lindsay. Um, Teresa uh, said exactly what I was thinking here. Um, um, in order to grow this work and sustain it over time, I think it's so important that teachers have time to work with one another in a supportive space. And um, I must say it was incredibly awkward having, you know, I think I had 10 people in my classroom watching me teach. and um, but having very specific time to discuss afterwards, really focused on student, engage, student engagement was incredibly powerful. And I think going into next year, if we were to um, find time and provide teachers with that time to be able to see their colleagues teach, but really focusing on engagement, um, I think that could be incredibly powerful. I know I learned a lot just from watching my colleagues teach. I haven't been able to do that a whole lot. So um, uh, it was incredibly powerful. Uh, another thing that I think would be helpful for continuing to grow this work and, and sustain it uh, would be like ongoing PD. I know um, Yemi had uh, discussed several times uh, doing this unit level planning and specifically using like understand by design and so i think some of that backwards planning and having pd even spending on that could be helpful um i know myself like that's something that uh we really dug deep into in my grad school program but hadn't we 
looked at it much in my teaching beyond that. I, it, it wasn't my day to day. I guess I had kind of found myself in this pattern of looking at the curriculum. Okay, what's next? And um, somehow found a way to kind of get out of that really impactful unit planning, um, which I don't want to be at, but somehow <laughs> I found out there. So I think having um, some of that ongoing PD relating to that, keeping it fresh in teachers' minds um, would be helpful. Just continue to revisit. Thank Ooh, you. I want to say one more thing too. Oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I have all kinds of notes here. Um, I, I'm thinking about um, doing. Let's see. I'm thinking small steps in the classroom, because I, I must admit, like going over the book, I'm like, wow, this is a lot. And it, but I think if I just focus on small steps to, to get started, I found that really helpful. Um, and some of the things that uh, that I found really impactful uh, are using the five planning questions. And I think that's even helpful now in this virtual realm of teaching. And then even just having uh, students reflect on their success uh, and then having them revisit their successes um, is also incredibly impactful. I think um, allowing this to grow, if I were to share that with my colleagues, having time to share that with my colleagues, I could see that catching on, um, saying, here's a student who is not often engaged, and yet here they are, proud of their work, and they're wanting to share their success. I think that right there is strong evidence to why we should do work like this. Kylie, as the principal of Rainier, how do you think about how this work grows and sustains in your school? So, unfortunately, as we've all said, we got kind of cut off, right, as we um, got some momentum. But um, one of the things that I was excited about at Rainier was um, it, it just so happened that um, our reflection after our four days with Yummy fell on a staff meeting where all my teachers planned to be there. And so they all got to hear um, our colleagues explain what this process looked like for them and, and how impactful it was to them. And I think that is, is one of the um, best selling points is hearing the people who have experienced it and, and the benefits they felt. Um, Cause like many have said, you know, there's a lot of PD out there, but hearing from your colleagues, this was something that really made a difference um, for me. I think weighs a lot heavier than some other, um, some other things. Um, as far as sustaining the work over time, you know, like I said, we've been lucky, we were lucky to have Yummy. We would love to have Yummy back, but um, I think, you know, experiencing what this looks like and then being able to go in and observe each other's classrooms. Um, to me, that's one of the things that, that makes the most impact on our work. You can hear so many things, but until you see it in action, you don't really know what that means. Um, and so going into each other's classrooms and seeing, seeing examples of the work and then reflecting and debriefing, um, and those are things that we can sustain outside of, um, you know, outside of these, those four days of PD. Um, it, it was amazing to have subs for four days. I know, I don't know other districts having the same struggles that we do with getting subs. Um, so being able to really just focus on the work that we were doing was, was phenomenal. Um, I know my hope, um, depending on what the future looks like for us, I would love to um, look at Yemi's book and really, you know, kind of break that apart with my staff and um, chunk it up and, and focus on, you know, bit by bit what, what that would look like um, in our classrooms. Kind of piggybacking on what some other people have said in response to the same question. Um, when we went in and observed each other, Yemi had us look at it um, from a lens of snapshots of engagement. So he had us look at what worked for kids and what does that require of us. And it, it, it's a different way to look at teaching. So our initial reaction 
is to say, you know, well, I would have done this differently or um, this worked, this didn't work. But that wasn't what we were looking for and that wasn't what we were writing down. Um, and I think that also took a little pressure off of, you know, you have all these people coming in to watch you. They're not watching you, they're watching the kids and they're watching, you know, quotes. What it, we were writing down what the kids were saying and what that had to do with their engagement. Um, and also examples like I knew the kids were engaged when they did this. Like I, I could see the engagement. Um, Jessica Anderson talked about it a couple questions back, but switching our focus from compliance to engagement is so huge. And I think that's something as far as sustaining the work, like as a building, we can do that. We can talk about that. Like it's not about are they being good? Are they engaged in rigorous, important learning? Um, and so just reframing our thought process. Um, the other two things that were, you know, my biggest takeaways were, um, you know, one of the things that Yummy had them plan for that I don't know that I've ever heard as part of a lesson plan before is what do you want the students to feel? Um, that's just very different from, from the mindset that I've always had. And then really designing that, thinking about that. Yummy uses the word chicken nuggets for your naughty friends. Um, and so what do you want your chicken nuggets to feel? What do you want those kids that, you know, when you go into a lesson and you're thinking, oh, and then, you know, Joseph's going to be sitting in the corner throwing things at his partners. Um, well, how do I get Joseph in? And how do I engage him? And how do I, what do I want Joseph to feel when this lesson is done? So, those were my big takeaways and and again i think sustaining the work over time it's it's we are very lucky that we had these four teachers that got to experience this and so um a benefit in our building is that i could have other teachers plan with them have a conversation plc with them go in and see the work that they're doing once we get to be together um and then use that to move the work forward Thank you, Kylie. Those were really powerful things to share as a building administrator, the things that you're looking into. All right, last question for this uh, panel group. What are your next steps? And I know the future is very unknown and every day something new <laughs> probably shakes, shakes your world a little bit. But what are your next steps as you think about this work, both for the unknown future and what possibly um, could happen. I'll begin. So I know for my partner and I in fifth uh, and then my counterparts in fourth, we had talked about, you know, jumping on our planning for next year and really mindfully using those questions, those five questions set out to plan and starting with a handful of strategies. So not trying to cast my net super wide at first, but to go deeper um, and really do well with a few of them, introducing them, uh, kind of build as I go. You know, we got to learn step by step and it's just like the kids, they're not experts at something right away. So giving myself uh, and my Rainier family some grace in that we're learning this too. And so it's new. I also, a big takeaway for me for my next steps is to plan for those high rigor, high engagement moments at the beginning. I feel like I frequently before would start small, conceptually build, and then you have these really exciting capstones or unit ending studies or awesome projects at the end. Um, and instead kind of hitting them with that bang right away, getting them hooked right at the very beginning with those pieces and then um, planning in mind for my toughest children, uh, making sure that if I plan for them, and it works for them, it's gonna work, it's gonna work for everybody else. But really starting with those high rigor, high interest moments at the beginning. And then um, also, I think as it was touched in the last question quite a bit, um, continuing to do observations and work with other teachers. It's so powerful to see other people in action. And I'm one of those individuals who I can hear it and I'm like, okay, but one, I can go in and I can actually see it uh, and it's works, that helps me. And to not only learn from my own teaching, but then watching my counterparts and being able to kind of grow together. Um, so I hope it kind of rolls out next step wise for me and for my building where we can continue to do that and grow this work. And I know that it will. I have an incredible administrator and staff, uh, Kylie Danielson, super on board with what we're doing um, and I'm just excited. I'm excited for the next steps. 
Uh, Kanani Thaxton, I, I, uh, I think we, as we were doing the workshop with Dr. Sembridge and um, even at right after, immediately after, we were already thinking to next year, okay, because it was, you know, January, February, going into March, and we were thinking, oh, we're going to do so much better next year. But then um, there was so many things that we could just do right off the bat. Um, so going into next year, definitely, we're going to, uh, I'm hoping that, um, that we can do more observations in our, we have an, an incredible, uh, Mrs. Wade Miller to help guide us and help us and, and provide that opportunity for us. Um, and I'm hoping that we can sneak Dr. Stembridge back in or, um, have workshops very similar to it, um, so that other student, other teachers can experience the same, same, um, creativities that we did. Um, but in the immediate, um, short goals. I mean, I've already, you can immediately put this into works in your online teaching. You can, instead of saying, hi, everybody, and going into a lesson of some sort, you can immediately give them a video to look at um, or start off your PowerPoint with a GIF um, and get students engaged right away, especially with us. If you only got the 45 minutes to, to speak with students, you want it to be pretty outstanding as soon as you get in the room with them um, as much as possible. And uh, and one thing that we're always kind of looking at when we're with Dr. Sandwich was, okay, what did they learn? How did they learn it? How did they feel when they learned it? Um, getting students to look at a video and then say, okay, what do you think about that? Give them some time to talk to each other about it and then say, okay, now I want you to put into the chat, the chat box. Tell me what it is you're thinking. Um, it's pretty, like you could do this. It's the 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 information that he gave to us was is extends like right now. It's it's something that you can immediately do in your online teaching, which I is what I love about it. It just I think it's again just a thought process. We had to change how we think about teaching. Um, I, I graduated year, I don't know, so this is seven or eight years ago, and um, thinking back to then, I was like, oh yeah, we used to go in and observe other teachers, and we used to uh, create these outstanding experiences, and then, like Lindsay had said, we get to the classroom, like, oh, well, this, this is, we have to open this book up, and this book up, and this, we have to do it in this order, um, but that's not how students are going to get engaged, and so, it, um, like, immediately, you can record uh, your your sessions with your students. You can play them back for their, your students. Uh, you can see what happened yourself and see how they are engaged. Uh, they themselves can reflect them, you know, on how they learned and what they learned. Um, I think um, planning for next year, portfolios, project-based learning, those types of things will encompass all of the different backgrounds uh, and then really engage students who, um, you, you just have to have those different ways of students being able to express their ideas. I remember a video that he had shown us about this student who um, seemed like he didn't get anything when after, they, after reading, but then you, you incorporate something that he loved like Batman, and he told you everything you were, he was, you know, he was supposed to know. So I think um, just, it's just a thought process change going back to when we were, you know, students and uh, learning about how to be a teacher, um, um, upping the rigor by providing students a way for them to connect meaningfully to their to the content that you want them to learn so it it's definitely something that you can do right now is just give them really huge experiences there's so many things that you can share online um, that are just immediate and you can put it out there right away and then have them talk about it in their online sessions and then have them chat about it in their sessions and then when you get off before you leave you're like this is what I want you to do and then they go off and do it and then they come back with then they're texting me or messaging me at midnight or uh, whatever it is that they're doing and they're not really a fifth grade um, but um, you know, it's just nice to know that you, it's something, it, the, the steps that he had given us or the, the, um, the information that he had given to us, the tools, um, it, it's just immediate. You can do it now instead of waiting for next year, although 
we all have bright ideas <laughs> right now for next year, but it, it's immediate. We can do it now. I, it was, I'm so thankful. Thank you. Angela, would you like to share? So they share, they already share a lot of the ideas that we, that I uh, was going to talk about, uh, making sure that we use those designs that are already out there, the portfolios and the project base and the capstones. Those are things that, like she said, years ago we used and then we went to Common Core and a lot of those things got pushed away. But I think those are things that we can use that kids can see and grow, grow on them, making sure that they have time to journal their thinking giving them time when they do something to write down. And even though, um, even in the beginning, you might need to give them stems and give them props, but see how, let them, and doing it in a portfolio, they can see as how their own thought processes grow throughout the years. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Clover Park teams, Custer and Rainier. Everyone online, we are gonna take a break, but before you do that, would you, show your video real quick if you aren't showing it. I just wanna do something really quickly. Some of the um, teachers on this presenting team have to leave and um, cannot stay through the rest of this session. So if we could just give them a nice sign language clap, which is simply shake those hands. It's a little bit of jazz hands. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Clover Park teams. Okay. Um, we are not done yet, but we are taking a break. So if we are taking about a 10 minute break, we will see you back here at 1045. Um, please keep your, you can keep your, your Zoom going, but you can definitely unvideo, keep yourself muted, and we'll see you back at 1045. Thank you everyone. To kind of introduce um, the the beginning of the movie, I kind of went back to our initial PD with Dr. Stembridge back in November, and how we had been kind of introduced to Dr. Stembridge and his ideas on culturally responsive education, and how um, I ended up almost having a very similar question, and I wanted to know more about. Um, uh, Dr. Assembridge's background and how he even came up with why was he in in this all and so um, going back to his roots in New York um, New York City and and being one of those on the fence type of students the way we have here in Lakewood um, you know some of these students that I'm looking at in my fifth grade class I'm thinking to myself oh man I've got to do something um, because in about five years, the student might give up and, and just based on demographics or social or, or whatever might be going on at home, um, he might be one, you know, he or she might be one that might just, just fall off the face of the earth and we will never hear from them again. And so I wanted to know from Dr. Sembridge's point of view, who and what happened, what exactly happened that made you think about, we need this type of, um, uh, this type of thought process or, or new information. And he was just saying it was all about his teachers. It was his teachers that really got him into the school, um, refocused him, and and now look at him. He's he's trying to get teachers uh, back on track to, to really think, okay, how am I going to get this student reeled back into education? How am I going to keep him or her there? Um, what engaging things are we going to do? Um, we had another uh, teacher who, at, who was sharing her reflection on something very similar that they did. Um, and the takeaway is always, um, it's better for us to learn from each other, not just talk about how much we collaborate with it, one another, but actually do the collaborating, which means we have to go into each other's classrooms. Um, being vulnerable and, and, and learning from each other, not just through PLC and talking about it and talking about our students' um, successes, but actually being able to go in and see it. See students engaging, see what's working, uh, what's not working, and, and how it worked, how the students feel, um, felt when they were doing, when they were engaged. Um, I think, I, I mean, that, those were the couple of things that we had talked about in our group. That was great. Thank you, Kanani. All right, the other teacher group, um, Shannon or Lindsay, do you want to report out a couple of key points? 
from your discussions? This, there was a lot of question uh, about culture and uh, that culturally responsive team. And it's, once you've been through Yami's, it really makes sense, but it, it's hard to grasp it until you experience it. We, we had a lot of uh, how we started to establish that relationship students. Thanks, Shannon. And Lindsay also wrote in the chat, uh, we talked about how we can carry this work on with other staff in the building. Thank you for that, Lindsay. Yeah, so we talked um, about, uh, you know, us doing trainings or how we can support other teachers and being able to see each other's uh, teaching and how students are engaged um, in all of our classrooms and just really trying to take an approach of learning from one another. I would, I would add to that, it's really important to understand the mindset when you ever want to appear in classrooms. It's not them as the teacher, it's about looking at the rigor and the engagement that you're seeing among the students. Thanks, Shannon. Let's go instructional coach. Teresa and Angela, would you like to share a few nuggets from your group? And I know that Teresa, you also shared in the chat. I did. Um, so we talked about making the shift to this online virtual world that we're in now, how to plan for learning experiences that are at that deeper level in this online world was a big part of our conversation. And so knowing that we only have a little bit of time with the kids um, and how do we plan for opportunities for them to be engaged and responsive when they're not specifically online with us at that time. Um, and with uh, questions from Jennifer, it was the use of video to get kids to be reflective. Yemi showed us a lot of videos when we were in the um, residency of students talking about their learning uh, and that we can still use that as an opportunity now in this virtual world. I shared that I have a quote from Dr. Stembridge that I use. Um, it's today I was successful when, because blank, when I was successful, I felt blank. And giving kids an opportunity, even in this virtual world, to create videos and share them with me about their successes. Um, we talked about uh, with coaches, having new teachers, um, Angela had some great comments about them modeling lessons, and we talked a great deal about connecting the uh, work of this instructional idea and connecting that to the evaluative frameworks, and the, they have the beautiful uh, position to be in where they can help teachers develop in a non-evaluative way. And that way, with good instructional practices, that way when they are evaluated, those instructional practices are in place. Angela, do you have anything to add from your group discussion? No, that's basically all we covered. She did a great job. Okay, thank you. And everyone, Gunnar wrote into the chat, well, my screen went crazy. Um, some a reflection from um, a group discussion in there around the how do students feel piece. So you might want to read into the chat about that. Um, Kylie, you're up next. What were some things with the principals discussion? Sorry, everyone. Um, 
So we we talked a lot about just the um, kind of the structure and and making it. And we had we had a lot of questions that we're not sure of answers to yet. But just how to how to replicate this on a bigger scale um, for a district or for even a building, because um, I talked a lot about the power of hearing Yemi speak and um, my teacher is really working with him and so what that would look like. And then we ended our discussion um, around the power of teachers watching other teachers teach and some of the hurdles that come um, with that work. Because um, like Yemi said, uh, you know, he's learned so much from watching exceptional teachers teach. And most buildings have some just amazing teachers that they could learn and grow from. But there's there's all kinds of different hurdles on getting teachers into each other's classrooms to see that work. So that's kind of where we where we ended our discussion. I love how the principals immediately go to the how to of that. I love it. Perfect. Thank you, Kylie. Kathy, how about district admin group? Some reflections from, from that group? Sure. Um, very similar to the principles, it's, you know, how do we access this? And one big point was if, if you can't replicate what we were able to do for whatever reason, the book is a great place to start um, accessing that book and, and using it as um, a common uh, launching point for conversations. And then we were fortunate to have um, Yemi in the room um, and something I wrote down that he said that the most critical thing that district administrators can do is put their egos aside and um, if your work is concentrating on seeing through the eyes of a teacher, then you can help kids. And I thought that was just really powerful. Thank you, Kathy. Um, that last few sentences you said, there, there were so many things in this leadership lab that could be tweeted. I mean, e e many of you have said really poignant quotes. I, I love it. Um, okay, one, one thing while we're talking about books, and Sue, I don't, sorry everyone, my PowerPoint is wigging out here. Um, and Sue, maybe, maybe you could tag on, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit about this, um, but if, for the district administrators that are in the room, could you talk about ways they could use their 664 money, Sue? <laughs> yes, <laughs> buy the book. <laughs> you can buy this book. <laughs> and um, I, something, I shared this with uh, the district admin group, but something I've done with a few groups is I've handed everyone a copy. I've said, just open it randomly. Look at the two pages that you, you know, read the two two pages that appear to you and share out with the group something that um, that strikes you and that has never failed to lead to an incredible conversation. Um, so uh, the I think has the, the book is one way everyone can access this, you know, right away. Um, and the TPEP 664 monies, which you probably, your district has probably been had held aside for professional learning and um, maybe sending some administrators to the summer conference, that kind of thing. Still have them register and attend the summer conference in its new virtual format, but take that travel money and plow it into some books. Um, any other money you have laying around, buy the book. I would say that's, um, that's a really good place to start. Um, and then if you, have, if you have teachers who have any time between now and the end of June, um, and can can sit together around the book or virtually sit together around the book. Um, I think that's, you know, even after school is over, if you can buy some of their time to do that, I think that's another great use of 664 funds. Thank you, Sue. And Erin added the link to Amazon in the chat where you can buy the book. I'm just going to do a little small plug. If you can buy this book local, buy it from a local independent bookstore if you can. It's, it's worth getting and support local, especially at this time. Um, okay, so to continue kind of the reflective conversation, we are now um, going to get to hear from Yemi. He sent me three pictures that I could pull from, and I just had to put them all into one slide. So that's what happens, Yemi, when you send me all your pics. Um, 
So we're going to hear from Yemi, and Yemi, we'd love to hear about what you heard going in and out of the rooms um, just now, but also what you heard from both the Custer and Rainier teams talking about the work and, and how they thought about the work post the teacher residency. Um, so take it away, Yemi. Okay, and I also put a, uh, another link in the chat. The book is on sale right now at the uh, Rutledge website, so it's like uh, 10 bucks cheaper than it normally is. I don't know how long that's going to last. I have nothing to do with the setting of the price point or anything like that, but I noticed that the other day. So if you want to save a couple of bucks, um, that's one place to go. So, um, you know, I heard a lot, and uh, what I also kind of want to do is... Um, I want to invite your questions. I, want, I don't want to necessarily wait until a, a Q&A point. I would love to be able to incorporate your questions right now into, um, into to my remarks. So what I would say is that um, if you got a, a question, you can put it in the chat, or if you click on the participants down, Nasway actually taught me this, if you click on the participants, icon at the bottom of your screen, it gives you a, you can raise your hand. And if you'd prefer just to speak your question, if it's easier for you to articulate that way, I'd love to hear it that way too. Um, you know, a, a couple of things that I would talk about, and, I, and so I'm kind of like synthesizing some comments here. Uh, you know, Ms. Thaxton asked me, I remember in, uh, in November when I first met you, Ms. Thaxton made a beeline up to me and she came up to me and she was like, well, what did, your, what did your teachers do? And you know, it's interesting, right? Because I was a, I was a super vulnerable kid. I was, I was incredibly vulnerable. I didn't even really understand how vulnerable I was until I was a young adult. And then I realized, right, as I was looking at the way risk factors contribute to the American achievement gap, how unlikely my story was. But I'm also, the older I've gotten, I'm, 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 I'm more hesitant to share some of the details of my story because what I've learned is that people look at me now and they don't see the kid that I was when I was 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. And so they don't, when I tell them, I'm the kid that would have kept you up at night I'm the kid, right, that, that I didn't read a book until I was like 17 years old, until I had these teachers who got through to me. A lot of times, teachers, I just, I don't think that they really are able to understand kind of how dependent I was, how much I needed teachers in my life. But here's what my teachers did for me, and here's what I think that this approach to culturally responsive education allows us to be able to do. It allows us to be able to earn the trust of students. And for our most vulnerable kids, here's a difference, right? When I talk about our school-proof kids, and then I talk about um, our most vulnerable kids, our school-proof kids, my, my son is a 22-year-old senior in college. Um, you know, between me and his mom, we have seven graduate degrees. My kid, never really liked school until he got to college. But he was never going to drop out. And he always understood through his lived experience how valuable education was. Um, and these are like big things and small things, right? Like all kinds of things that contribute to his understanding over a lifetime. Even though I don't like school necessarily, and I'm not crazy about what we're doing here, I got to suffer through this because this is what people do. And besides, my parents would probably harm me if I don't do what I'm supposed to do. Trust is essential for our most vulnerable students. And incidentally, what the research on trust says is that the absolute worst thing that you can say to someone if you're trying to earn their trust is, you can trust me. Right, when, when, when you say that, like that's like red flag, you know, a kid like me from the Bronx is gonna be like, I can trust you? Sure, okay, that sounds like something that somebody says to, to set me up for a con. But trust in the model that we're using is afforded through that opportunity to make a connection, a connection that is available to me uniquely through my experience, a connection that builds on an understanding and experience and expertise. And I'm able to connect that understanding, this part of my background, this all that's kind of like that 
oh, this reminds me of, oh, this makes me think of. When I can get a kiddo to make a connection to my content, my big ideas, and I can connect to their background, their schema, which includes all parts of their identity, their racial, their ethnic, their language, their, their, their religious, right, their, their community. When I can make a connection to their insights, their understandings, and then I can show them how that's useful to them in thinking rigorously, every time I'm able to do that with a kid, I emerge from that transaction with that kiddo more trustworthy than I was before. And what the research on trust tells us, and you already have experienced this yourself in your own life, where you find people to be trustworthy, you are in turn more trustworthy to them. And so for me, with my chicken nuggets, what I'm always looking for, here, here's when you know you got the kid. Because, oh, by the way, being culturally responsive is not going to guarantee that your chicken nuggets won't have their chicken nuggety days, right? Like that's just what chicken nuggets do. We love them for that, right? They keep, us, they keep it interesting. But I always, I realize in my teaching that I want to get to the point where I can just look at a kid like this, right? Give him that teacher look like. And that's the point where the kid, it's already been established that I'm a trustworthy figure and I'm going to hold you accountable for your behavior, but we're going to talk about your behavior. I'm not going to, I'm not going to attack your, your entire character. And that keeps the opportunity alive for this kiddo to bring their selves, their experiences, their knowings into my learning experiences, find those connections. This is the way that we get kids to see us as a person and the spaces that we oversee as spaces in which they can authentically, legitimately invest themselves. So, you know, there are a lot of different ways that we can think about what we're going for, but that trust piece, I think is, um, it's essential. I heard one of the groups looking at, um, talking about the relationship triangle. Is it possible, can I share my screen, Naswe? I'm pretty sure I can't, oh, no, I see, you got me, you got me disabled. You, you, you're big time in me right now. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Aaron, do you want to make Yemi a co-host? It's no big deal. Yemi, yeah, you should be able to share your screen now. Got it. Okay. And uh, let me just see here. Okay. You have to give me a thumbs up. And can you see my screen now? Can you see the relationship triangle? Okay. So um, I forget what page this is in the book, right? But this is one of the things that I heard one of the groups talking about, this relationship triangle, right? Relationships being one of the, the six themes that we're talking about. And one of the things that we go after here is we're looking to, and this is where I think a lot of teachers miss it. The goal, our goal in connecting with kids is um, not to like get the most Facebook friends and not to even necessarily be the coolest teacher. Our goal is to be seen as trustworthy so that in our teaching, we can be a, a reliable model for how a person, a trustworthy person, a person that kids know and can touch, how they themselves relate to their content. And so the work of trust, giving kids opportunities to make their connections, honoring the knowings that they're bringing to bear, give them license to dig deeper into their own relationship building with content. And when I say contents, for some kiddos, what we're talking about is just the general idea of school. And so um, that for me is, um, I, heard, I heard one of the groups speaking about that. And that's always, I think, kind of one of the, uh, the more important points um, that, uh, that I like to kind of flesh out in our planning spaces. But I'm going to go back here and I'm going to look and see if there are any questions because I, I there's a lot of stuff that I could talk about. But um, let me see if there's. And Yemi, we did. Ha I had a question that was posted to me, but really for you. Please. Um, how do you see your work connecting to the instructional framework? We have three in our state, the Danielson, the Marzano, and then we have the Center for Educational Leadership out of the University of Washington. How do you see those connecting into culturally responsive education? For all of these models, at the far end, right, at the super high achieving, the part of the matrices that we want the most, 
it's always essentially the teacher is facilitating learning, facilitating stu students thinking, and the students are at the reins. And so for me, right, like, and even even for me as a facilitator of the of the of the residencies, if, if for everyone who was in a residency, if you think back to our residencies, I was trying to do the same thing that I hope that you're able to do with your students. In some cases, I'm front loading, right? Like, although if you recall, at the very beginning of our session, the first thing I asked you to do was to think about what do you want to get out of this. And so, in doing so, right, like you are now centering your learning and your questions. And so when I hear your questions, I know what content, I know what big ideas I want to share, I want to teach. But I'm able to help you connect the big ideas that I'm sharing with the questions that you're bringing to bear. Right now, by the end of the residency, if you recall, uh, you know, last day, day and a half, if I'm doing well, I'm doing way less talking than you are. You're planning, you're thinking, you're making connections, you're putting the content, our content, in, in your terms, thinking about your particular kiddos, thinking about what their interests are, thinking about what their background is, where they come from, where you want them to go, and then you're funneling all of that into a unit design, the design of a unit's worth of learning experiences. So, um, so for me, right, the instructional frameworks are always asking us to facilitate our students' thinking so that the students take control. As a matter of fact, right, even in the book, I think, right, I talk about, here's the thing about the book is that I've been talking about this stuff for years in, you know, planning rooms with teachers. So even the jokes in that book are jokes that I've told in real life, you know, spaces with teachers, right, like the writing of the book was really more or less a documenting of the conversations I've been having for the past several years. But I refer to um, high rigor moments, these moments where the kids are thinking rigorously as, as um, something like going to Las Vegas, right? Because when you, if, if, you, if you know how to do Las Vegas, right, you know, I'm getting a little bit older, right? So I'm not doing Las Vegas like I used to. But, you know, the best Las Vegas trips are the ones where, you know, there's a point where you've lost control. And you're not exactly sure what might happen next, right? Those best Vegas trips, maybe not when you're, you know, 50 or older, but, you know, we're definitely when you're in your 20s. That's what we want when we're teaching. When we're teaching, we want this experience, and it's a little bit scary, where your kids are thinking in the ways you want them to think, and they're making connections that you can't entirely predict, because though you know a lot about your kids, you can't possibly know everything about what they're bringing to bear. And so in my view, I know that I've nailed rigor and I know that I've nailed student ownership when I feel terrified because I'm not exactly sure where this is going to go. But when I plan thoughtfully, I always have the opportunity to come back and make the, the, the bigger meta connections that I want to make. So for me, it's all about designing your unit so that you will lose control. And in the losing of control, that's when you really learn about your kids. That's when you really get to discover the assets, the interests, the motivations that your students are um, leveraging to sustain their engagement. Two, two questions, Yemi. Yes. One is, is there any chance people could get a copy of the diagram you showed? I know it's in your book and people, you should go buy the book, but is there any chance that could be shared? You can think about it and let us know. Just that, that one diagram? Yeah, the triangle. Yeah, okay, cool. So what I can do is I can just tweet it. I'll tweet it. And you got to follow him, folks. At, at Dr. Yimmy S, at D-R-Y-E-M-I-S, at Dr. Yimmy S. I'll tweet it in like if, as soon as we end this, uh, this call. As a matter of fact, something else I wanted to give you. I'm going to put this in here also, and I'm still open for questions. This is, I'm typing it in right now. Um, this is a link to one of the video podcasts that I use. This is a family narrative video podcast. And what I did was, this is one of the first video podcasts that I did several years ago. And uh, this documents a unit that I did with a fourth grade team um, on theme. It was an ELA unit. 
giving kids the opportunity to uh, really understand what we mean by theme, by exploring themes in their own family narratives. I was a high school teacher. One of the things that I, I, I struggled with as a high school English teacher was so many of my kids um, just really didn't understand theme. Uh, a lot of them thought plot was theme. And then I had kiddos who, you know, really didn't want to read, but why would you want to read if there's no theme available to you? Theme is part of what makes reading, especially, um, you know, rigorous reading, uh, fun. So what you can see in this, um, in this uh, video podcast, the link to which I've just shared, is um, the documentation of a, about a six-week unit with a fourth grade um, classroom on family narrative. And then we went uh, to the trouble of making a whole series, four videos of how to. So if you, you could totally use this as um, professional development along with the book to help see how a team fleshed out the ideas. And then I'll, 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 tweet, the, um, I'll tweet the relationships. And then one other thing I'll put in here right now, let me see, okay, I just put this in here. This is a link to an article that I just, um, wrote for the Ed Week Classroom Q&A um, blog about supporting African-American students in the school closure crisis. And uh, you'll see in the very beginning of that, right, always keep in mind that there's a challenge where, I, you know, they asked me to keep my response under 1,200 words. And when I it was 1198, all right? So it's always a challenge, right, to take this big idea and to boil it down into something, you know, um, short and readable for, uh, for, for an Ed Week publication. But one of the things that I began with was saying, you know, that there, there's some good reasons to ask that question. How do we ask that question? How do we support African-American students and some not so good reasons? The not so good reasons are the reasons that would lead us to checklists and stereotypes. So, you know, the thing that I always tell people, right, I talk about, you know, the ethnic group African-American more, more than anything because I'm African-American um, and just because I want to make sure that I'm not offending anyone by presuming to be able to speak for a group for which I don't have a personal experience. But I'm going to say something that I think applies to every ethnic group. I know a lot of Black people and all Black people are not exactly the same. They're not a monolith, right? There's a range of expansive experiences that exist under the umbrella of African-American. And so we have to be careful in our search for effective strategies and practices that work with our kids, that we don't limit them through our own stereotype view of who they are. Okay, so, um, so but here's the thing, is that we do know that African-American students are among the groups that um, historically um, perform at the lowest levels in terms of the stupid high stakes standardized testing measures that we've always used, which might go away. We have an opportunity here to uh, bury those things. But if we're doing well with the group that historically consistently performs at lower levels than every other group, then we're probably also serving the needs of our higher performing groups as well. So that's the good reason to look at any particular group in your, um, in, in, in your, in your school, in your, in your, you know, service area. But you just have to make sure that you're careful, right? Because if you do something and you're like, oh, well, Dr. Stembridge told me to do this and that this would work with my black students and it doesn't work, that doesn't mean that the strategy is flawed. It may, it may mean that you need to be thinking about your relationship. It may mean that kid just doesn't trust you. Or it may mean that there's another, you know, layer of support that you need to build in in order to, um, to really get kids to see the opportunity as valuable enough to invest themselves. I'm going to pause in. Yummy, we have eight minutes and there are two questions. One is, this is from Jen Ireland. Do you have advice for possible scenarios of starting the year virtually next school year? I see relationships and trust building such a critical aspect to student learning. As a parent and in my role supporting teachers, I see that as being one of the, our potentially greatest challenges that happen, that should happen. So I'm sorry, I know you said we had two questions. I'm trying to be kind of brief. So listen, I don't know all the things that you know, especially district administrators. I find it highly unlikely that schools will be reconvening in August and September. I mean, I just, I mean, until we have the capacity for widespread testing, 
you know, I'm not even thinking about a vaccine because I know the science and I know how vaccines are created. And um, I think a vaccine is in the distant future. But when we go back to schools, we're going to have to go back to schools with some variation, some type of social distancing. And, um, and then, of course, we're expecting another wave of COVID-19 at some point. I think we're wise to plan um, to be virtual for a while, okay? Challenging. No easy answers to this. Here's what I'm thinking about. What I'm thinking about is I have two nephews. My two nephews are uh, video gamers. And so I watch them playing video games. And I watch how they connect with video game communities. I watch these two little weirdos. I love these kids. I watch these two weirdos. I shouldn't say little, one of them 6'9". I watch them watch another weirdo on a couch playing a video game and then taking what they've observed from this one weirdo and then them, these weirdos applying it to their own video game playing. So part of what we have to do is we need to study how they're already engaged in virtual learning communities because they are. They are. They may not be virtual learning communities that we place a high premium on, but they do. That's one thing. And then the other thing that I'm doing, and, uh, and I've got several uh, you know, younger teachers who uh, who, who, I, who I guess I kind of mentor, I guess you can say I mentor them. And so, um, so we just I have like a little think tank and I'm just like, hanging out with them virtually and trying to figure out what they're doing. So one of the things that we're doing in our little think tank is we are studying um, YouTube personalities that we think of as particularly engaging. And then we're asking ourselves what's engaging about what they're doing on this screen. And uh, one, of my, one of my people who I like a lot is this guy, you can look him up, he's Alex the Cooking Guy. Some guy, French guy, speaks English. Um, he, he, he does these cooking uh, videos and they're so good. And he's got so much screen presence. And what he does is he gives you something that piques your interest. And then he gives you something to do so that you can try this out for yourself. There are others, um, uh, one of my, uh, one of my, my teachers, um, she likes, um, uh, it's, it's called um, thinking, I'm going to have to look it up. It's called Smarter Every Day. She likes Smarter Every Day. That's another one to look up. And then there are a couple of names. There are a couple of names. I'll try to, I'll try to pull them up. And uh, as a matter of fact, I might just blast people an email afterwards. But I'm studying some of these virtual presences and figuring out, and, and here's, what, here's what me and my, my mentee teachers are doing. We're literally watching a video and then we're time stamping it. And we're asking ourselves, when did I feel engaged? And then at that point when we feel engaged, we're saying, okay, why? Why am I engaged? What's working for me right now? What am I wanting to do? What am I thinking is going to come next? We're unpacking that moment of engagement so that we can understand it better and hopefully have a chance to apply it in our own teaching. A lot more that we could say about that, but you said there was one more question also? Well, I'm looking back at it. Mark, I don't know if you're on here. McKechnie, um, you posted, what do you want students to feel? Question mark. This is the place that connects academics, pedagogy, behavior, classroom management, A plus B equals C. And then he has these um, feelings listed in the chat. Mark, do you want to speak to that? Um, sure. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't really posing it as a question. I, it yeah, I realized that after I re reread it. I'm sorry. Process, processing. Since I I mostly come from the behavioral side of things and have a background as a social worker and how this fits with teaching, I I kept coming back to this that you know really setting up a context and talking thinking about how each and every student can be engaged is is most of the work that needs to be done to address behavior in classroom management. So I'm putting up, uh, can you see my screen now? All right, okay, so this is uh, Mark. This comes from, again, from my, my favorite cognitive scientist. Uh, you're entitled to have your favorite. I got mine, Mary Helen Emerdino Yang. And um, one of the reasons why she's my favorite cognitive scientist is she began her career as a middle school science teacher. 
And so even though she has, I'm pretty sure she has three doctorates now, one in cognitive science, one in uh, psychology, and she has an EDD in education. Um, all of her stuff, for me, it speaks to teaching. And so, you know, here's the thing, Mark, because of your background, that's the question that really resonates for you. That's the question that kind of brings it all together. And that's a question that some people just haven't thought about. A lot of people haven't thought about explicitly. Um, but, it's, uh, but for other people, it's the first question. And you know, what do you want your students to understand? Which, by the way, the what do you want your students to understand? Uh, my teachers who participated in the residencies, you remember how much time we spent on that? paring down the, um, the instructional goals that are listed in the curriculum so that we could find those truly enduring understandings. Here's what happens when we do that. When we do that, we're able consciously and non-consciously to address some of the implicit biases that are unchecked in terms of how we are even thinking about the goals for our instruction. Okay, not just the goals, but then also the expectations for how students are gonna perform their understanding of the goals. But I love in terms of the what do you want students to feel question, I always love going back to, to this chart. And, um, and what I can also do is I can also give you this article. Uh, this graph uh, shows up in a lot of her work, but I'll, I'll also give you this article. So what I'll do is I will, um, I, I'll tweet it and then I'll also send it to Naswe so that you can blast it to everyone who's a part of our group. Uh, but this helps me to really see, and, and, and yeah, everything that you wrote down in the chat, I agree with 100%, Mark. If we get a kid to feel like this, and you got a good understanding that's worth thinking about, and you have them thinking about it in a rigorous way, it's almost impossible for it to not be engaging. And so um, a lot of times teachers are prioritizing the content over the students learning, in which case it feels uh, like a, a task to have to think about what you want students to feel. But if your students associate your learning space with these, uh, these, these positive affects, with something that is interesting to them, worthy of their affective engagement, um, you know, what I find is that when I do this enough, my kids give me grace on the days that I'm not so good. They end up expecting and, um, you know, a, a certain kind of experience in my classroom so that when I'm a little bit flat, um, the emotion that we've uh, incorporated into previous learning experiences, there's a carryover effect. And it, uh, it continues to, to, uh, to support my, my ability to teach well. Um, like I said, even on the days where it's not necessarily, um, you know, the, the, my best instruction. I don't know about you. Some days I'm not as, as good as I, as I want to be. All right. Um, but yeah, and, and the other person whose name I like to bring up just to kind of help out, and I'll, I'll, I'll tweet this out too. So this is the third thing. So I'm going to do the relationships. I'm going to do um, uh, the uh, Mary Helen e. Mordino Yang article. And then I'm going to also do, I like to have this one pager of um, emotion words from the work of Marshall Rosenberg. Does anybody know the work of Marshall Rosenberg, Nonviolent Communication? This is something that's good to read also for anyone who is in a long-term committed monogamous relationship. This will help you out in terms of how you're able to communicate effectively uh, in your home. You can thank me for that later. You send me a side, a side email to, to thank me for saving your relationship. But with Rosenberg, one of the essential premises of Rosenberg's work is that when we communicate in a way that is cognizant of need, we are more likely to uh, facilitate a, 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 a safe, fulfilling affect. And, um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll send out the one pager of words that I'll sometimes use when we're asking, what do you want students to feel? And just looking at that one pager of words often helps teachers to better conceptualize what it is that they're truly going after uh, for their students. A lot more we could say, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at our time. Thank you, Yemi. We really, really have enjoyed engaging with you at this leadership lab. Folks, we're wrapping things up. Um, you will get a follow-up email with all of the things Yemi is going to provide. If you haven't um, followed him on Twitter, please do so. If you don't have a Twitter account, get one. Um, in the follow-up email, we'll have an evaluation survey about this leadership lab. Um, taking that is very helpful to us, especially as we're transitioning to more online 
offering. So anything you can help provide feedback on is helpful to us. Clock hour information will also be in that email. Links to this recording will also be there. And then these leadership labs are, are magical in our way, but they're also replicable. So we will share a little bit of a, a couple of pagers. If you wanna do a, a version of a leadership lab about a topic, any topic, it works with anything. Um, this is kind of a nice way to do that. Um, show, show your faces if you can one last time. We wanna do a, some shout outs here. Um, this is the sign for hand clapping in sign language. Hand claps to the Clover Park teams, the Custer and Rainier teams. Thank you so much. Big thank you to Dr. Yemi Stembridge. You're awesome. We love you. And Sue Anderson for making this opportunity something real in our state. So thank you, everyone. And we are starting our next leadership lab at one o'clock this afternoon. And I know some of you are also coming to that one. So we'll see you there. Thanks, everyone.